Hey, everybody. Welcome on back to the Twisted History podcast. All right, so Twisted History. Twisted History this week is uh, the Twisted History of Lewis and Clark. We've been going broad. Oh, so it's me and Vibs. Yep. Me and Vibs yep. again. Uh, St. Anne is in the house. Uh, John is on walkabout. Where in the world is Johnny San Diego? Where the fuck is Johnny San Diego? I, I think he's in Orlando. I've been hearing reports that he's in the south. Somewhere he's, in the south. <laughs> he's in the south. He's, uh, he's with the four play guys down south. The reason that John gets pulled away all the time is, unfortunately, for us, John is an excellent producer. He's also an excellent cameraman. He's also an excellent editor. So he's in uh, he's in demand. So he gets pulled many different directions. Right now, I think it's Orlando, and he's with Riggsy and the boys. Uh, last I saw, they were interviewing somebody from the LPGA, uh, which means absolutely nothing to me, but he'll be back next week. Jim Ursay posted a picture last night of him in a cowboy hat with a guitar by a campfire. It looked exactly like Riggsy in like 20 years. Really? Yes. Just Well, well Riggsy had the surgery to fix his eye, right. but Jim Ursay has not had a surgery to fix his lazy no. eye. It is yeah. a bad lazy eye. Every now and again, Riggsy's eye goes just a little off course. It's a little crooked. I don't think, I don't think it's perfect. The muscles in the retina aren't, aren't, aren't fully there yet. He said not. it's going to take a while. Yeah. Right? So, But I think he kept the receipt. I don't, anyway, Riggsy's one of my favorite guys, yes. so I'm not shitting on him. And I think he's very handsome with or without the eye. It's, it's fun to shit on Riggsy because he's a, a billionaire who just plays golf all day. He, 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 he hit the jackpot. People who don't know what the fuck we're own talking hard about, work. there's a guy, Riggs, here, and he, he, he's the guy who does the Barstool Classic. He's the guy who does that 20-destination golf tournament that people are lining up, clamoring over themselves to get into. I've been lucky enough to be invited to a couple. Of, have you ever been to one? I have. They're awesome. Very fun. They're I actually very, met Riggsy's dad. They're very well-run <laughs> golf tournaments. Yeah, yeah. They're all over the country. They do a great job. I don't know why I'm blowing rigs. Like uh, Vibs's point, he's making a ton of dough off this, I think. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so that's where John is. John decided to pick his team, and this week it's uh, the four-play guys. But he'll be back next week. And this is the Twisted History of Lewis and Clark. The reason I'm doing the Twisted History of Lewis and Clark is twofold. We've been doing a lot of broad topics lately. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of broad topics where we'll do the twisted history of death. Right? Remember we did the twisted history of death. Right. Like there's no way I can do the twisted history of death, the twisted history of World War Two, the twisted history of, of of holidays even. Like I can't take these broad ass topics and get them done in an hour, an hour and a half. I can't do it. Yeah. So like I always say to you guys, and by the way, There'll be a part two. Twisted History Serial Killers is stupid, right? Twisted Ser Hi History Serial Killers part one is better, but I could do a Twisted History of cross-eyed serial killers who kind of look like old rigs, <laughs> and I'd be able to bang out an hour and a half. That's how broad it is. Yeah. Uh, you can watch 10 documentaries yep. on Martin Luther King Jr., yeah. and you're going to find out different information in each one. You'll have the same bare bones in a couple, but right. it, history is just so massive. But I think that if we do the Twisted History of Lewis and Clark... And I'll go off on tangents, so don't expect this just to be the uh, the expedition, obviously. I think by the end of this podcast, I'll have nailed it shut. Yeah. I'll tell you right now, everything that I'm going to tell you, th this had happened in 1803, let's say, right? So that's over 200 years ago. There are conflicting stories about everything that happened on Lewis and Clark's uh, expedition. I will tell you that Lewis and Clark's expedition was all but forgotten for nearly a century. Like, the journals were never published right away. Like, so this thing happened. It was a big to-do. Everyone kind of got, you know, relatively comfortable from it. Meriwether Lewis wound up getting into severe depression. He may or may not have killed himself. But all this stuff, and then all of a sudden it faded out of memory. It had this resurrection and, uh, you know, people finding mercury and shit and whatnot, mm -hmm. which we'll go through. So there are conflicting stories. So if people want to come at me and be like, no, no, this is what happened. This is what happened. I, I get that. But from what we have done in our research, this is the story of Lewis and Clark. That's that's the one reason why we're doing it. We're going from like a broader topic. We're getting a little bit more granular. I watched the Ken Burns right. Lewis and Clark documentary. It's like eighteen hours long, right. but it's it's phenomenal. It's so good. And that so, that guy just eats our lunch. Like he's he's just so fucking good. Oh, he's, he's the best he's, ever. Doing he's right? PBS's cash cow. I mean, yeah. he's all they have. Once once he's gone, well, now her, his like daughter is like kind of taking a spot. Is she? Yeah. Bitch. Um, but no, you, I've never talk? seen a single one of his documentaries. I've oh. never seen baseball. Was he the one who did the baseball yes, one? Yes, large. It's so good. I, I mean, if you're not a baseball fan, I am. I love. Yeah, I, I like going to Paul Park. I'm not like one of those guys who watch it on TV. Really. Right, so, right, yeah, yeah. yeah, like a purist. Who's yeah, yeah. Like, oh, his ERA is really low. Right, right. right. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it. 
I've even watched like jazz and country music, mm-hmm. and I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of either. But right. they were very interesting. You know, yeah. what I mean? like seeing those names and seeing how it all started. But to to go back to what you were saying with uh, it's such a broad thing. Right. Whenever we did the twisted history of evangelists, evangelicals. Yeah. Is that my saying that right? Evangelist. Evangelist, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, with, with Jim Baker and Tammy Faye. Right. I didn't really understand all the moving parts with it. Right. I. Another thing we talked about was, what's something you like that other people don't like? Yes. This this podcast has got me obsessed with biopics. I love watching historic biopics now. You like and that seeing now. If, yeah. Right. So I watched Through the Eyes of Tammy Faye. Uh, I heard uh, she did an amazing job. The, Who J- Ju- is it? Julie Chastain is that her Jessica name? Chastain. Jessica Chastain. Jessica Chastain. Jessica yeah. Chastain played Tammy Faye yes. Baker. She She's unbelievable. That's why right when you said twisted, like when you were talking about you know, um, when you said broads before, I thought you actually meant like Betty White, Franca Viola, all these different women. <laughs> right, right. Oh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was it was very good to watch. Uh, Andrew Garfield plays Jim Baker. Right. And it's, Who's it's another great actor. He's, he's phenomenal. He did a good job. He was a little too like weird and goofy. So I found out Kevin Spacey played falling from like fall from grace. Mm-hmm. Kevin Spacey played Jim Baker back in the day. He did okay. a perfect job because he's just a creepy yeah, psycho. Yeah, yeah. Pretty spot on. <laughs> but uh, it's it's great. Through the eyes of Tammy Faye, it got like a fifty percent on Rotten Tomatoes. I'd, I'd watch it. If oh, you, really? Got it, shit on. Yeah. If you wanna, I think the acting was good, but they didn't really care for the script. But if you want to have like a, a an extra something to go with the evangelist. Podcast right. that we watch, watch through the eyes of Tammy Faye. It's, right. it's, it's, we touched on so many of them in that thing too. Yes, we, we did a, like a mm-hmm. a bandolier strap of just like that was one of our taking first them ones. out, and yeah. shitting on somebody, and but the Tammy Faye Baker um, one, Jim Baker, Tammy Faye Baker, like right up until modern day where they sell um, disaster. Right. Preparation mm-hmm. kits. Bunkers. They Stuff sell bunker. those. Yeah. yeah they it, sell that fucking the five gallon tubs. And if you get on Google and look for gifts, I, I blogged about this. I was looking for gifts. There's just t- there's there's Jim Baker just like hugging tubs of survival like yeah. right. goop. And he has like this silver nitrate stuff, which uh, which cures COVID and AIDS. And he sells it. It's yeah. unbelievable. It's <laughs> like 60 bucks. You could never have AIDS and never have COVID. And I didn't know that. Like and I pay attention. I'm one of those guys that watches the news, mm-hmm. and the news really hasn't caught on yet that Jim Baker has the cure to both AIDS and COVID in his fucking possession, which is which is fantastic. You can't yeah. put a price on that. I mean, when you've got thank a, you, Jim. When you've got a direct line to God, <laughs> yeah. you're gonna get some. You're gonna get a little. Pr- you're gonna get privy yeah. to information. You're the biopic guy. Yeah, it's yeah. funny too because like I see, you know, like when we pick people to sort of jump in every now and again. Chief does it a lot from Chicago. Mm-hmm. Eddie does it every now and again from Chicago. I know Carl wants to do it. I just I don't speak to White Sox Dave as much as the other three fellas. I probably speak to Chief the most, and I did a couple of trips with Carl. I love them all, but I think Chief is a huge documentary guy. Huge. Oh, Dante too, by the way. Yeah. All the Chicago guys, like the biopics, are something different, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The documentary ones, these guys fucking tear them up, love you know. Them. So. Anywho, so there's, there's all these things going on. I don't watch them. I, like, it's the same thing. Like, when I was blogging heavy for Take a Report, people would be like, well, what other blogs do you read? And I'm like, I would never read blogs because if I saw something great, I can't help but steal it. Right. You yeah, know what yeah. I'm saying? And, I, and it's not like all I do on this podcast, all we do on this podcast, rather, is steal stuff because it's history. Mm. Um, and I just never... I don't know. I very rarely watch documentaries or biopics. They should get back into you it. You watched though. the Al Capone biopic, correct? And then you said it was like the worst biopic of all so time. So the movie, yeah, the the movie, with uh, yeah. Tom Hardy. Oof, I, that was disgraceful. I'm still working up the courage to watch that to see if I will hate it as much as you did. Oh, my it God. It was awful. It was, it was, it was awful. All right. All right. So, all right. So, and she's a huge Tom Hardy fan. Yeah. yeah you can't yeah. even watch that with the sound off. Like, it yeah. Was yeah. Right. There's, yeah. yeah. There's some biopics you just... I, even if they're bad, I still watch them. I'm trying to think what uh, pretty bad, like W, that kind of sucked. But yeah. I watched, I sat through the whole thing. And Right, uh, right, right. Uh, John just saw the one with, um, John's probably going to cut all this, by the way. John just saw the one with the Williams sisters, and he loved it. That was great. The, yeah, yeah, he loved that shit. So we'll do all that stuff. Yeah. But getting back to the podcast, why not? Um, oh, another thing. Uh, one of our listeners had reached out. He was like, Large, I know, we all know how I killed Betty White. He's like, and then when you did the Twisted History of Dogs, you almost killed your dog, right? Like, because oh Blue God. Cheese almost died. Yeah. Wound up paying five grand um, after she ate five Advil to get her back on the road to uh, uh, recovery. After I did the Twisted History of Dogs, my dog almost died. He's like, so even though you killed Betty White, I thought that you got off easy with five grand and that you almost killed your dog. He's like, until 
I listened to the podcast the same day that my dog died. He's like, so you killed Betty White and you wound up killing my dog. So I don't even know now what my power is. So I'm going to go Lewis and Clark this week because I guess if you're a descendant of Lewis and Clark, maybe watch your ass. But next week I'm going to try and be a little more targeted. Maybe we'll do like OJ or, or, or Woody Allen or just Lane Maxwell or something like that. We'll go. We'll start to target people to die. Um, but, you know, thoughts and prayers to this gentleman. And he sent me a picture of the dog. Cutest fucking thing in the world. So, uh. <laughs> condolences thoughts and prayers i don't know the power of this mm -hmm. podcast we've talked about lewis and clark before we've had we've had to have talked about lewis and clark before because we've done a lot about american history although that turn of the century for uh the 19th century when we went from the 1700s to the 1800s we don't spend a lot of time in uh vibs and i float around history but we always kind of wind up into a part where we're like oh by the way wasn't that prohibition like, we always kind of wind up in the early 1900s. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we do. It just it just happens to be like, oh, wasn't that the start of World War One? And, of course, there's so much shit that happened. <laughs> you know, we did that with Betty White. Like, we saw what had happened since she was born in 1922. Uh, January 17th, 1922, Betty White was born. Since 1922 on, there was so much sexy shit. There's a lot to talk about. Spanish flu, and, uh, Great Depression, crash of the, new, uh, the stock market, World War II, World War I, Vietnam, Korean War, Cuban Missile Crisis, like all that stuff, mm. that we don't really go back and spend that much time at the turn of the century for when the clock ticked from 1799 to 1800. That all changes today. That's where we're going to hang out. Yeah. We're going to hang out in that, that, that part of American history. I feel like we've got the Revolutionary War, and then once it's kind of over, we're like, ah, we did it. Right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And So, and there is a gap. There really is a gap. But I will tell you, in 1800, if you're looking to take the pulse of uh, being an American citizen, it's still not cool to be black. It's not cool to be black back then. Mm -hmm. Still, it's not good. But there was also, you know, you got to figure out that, you know, once the 13 colonies were established and then we started to break out in statehood and whatnot, there was a whole country just ready to be explored and possibly conquered. But the group of Americans that were here on this side of the pond were Europeans. And outside of a couple of, indis uh, a couple of distinct Europeans, like Hitler, a lot of people were just comfortable where they were. Like Spain has definitive borders, and for the most part, most Spaniards are like, why don't we own France too? Or why don't we own Germany? Like... For the most part, people don't mind having borders or sharing a continent with somebody. So the idea of the manifest destiny where we had to go from coast to coast, people didn't necessarily buy into, which you would think would be strange because we're America. We needed to touch the Atlantic and walk right through the Pacific. That wasn't the case for people in 1800s who had a European thought process where they could be in Ireland. And be no, they can be in England and not necessarily have to own Scotland. It's a yeah. terrible example because England wanted to own the whole right. fucking planet. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying. Like Finland didn't need to cross over borders. Mm -hmm. Germany did, right? Like Russia stopped, India stopped, China stopped. Like they all like imagine somebody owned uh, Manifest Destiny in Europe and owned the tip of France all the way to the tip of China. That'd be r ridiculous. But that's what happened with our continent, mm -hmm. obviously. But I wanted to get you in the mindset that that wasn't the case back then. All right? So we talked about them in b before, and then I just spoke about how we did the Twisted History of Dogs either la la last week. This guy, Mike Lane, wrote in, a loyal listener, and he had said, listen, I just want you to know when you did the Twisted History of Dogs, you didn't mention um, Lewis and Clark and Lewis and Clark on that expedition, that famous in expedition, it said that they ate over 200 dogs. Yeah. That's an important thing for me to know. I didn't know that. And then he said, he had, he didn't tell me, but once I started doing some research, it wind up, and this is the critical point. These guys ate a lot of stuff that they're not proud of on that trip. They ate over 200 dogs, but they never eat, uh, never ate semen. And I'll get to the, the, to the bottom of that by the end of the thing. But let's go back. Let's talk about Lewis and Clark. The Lewis and Clark expedition lasted from August 31st, 1803, end of summer, 1803, to September 25th, 1806, right? Beginning of fall, 1806. So it was a solid three years. The guys who went on that were also referred to as the core of Discovery Expedition. So the Lewis and Clark Expedition was also called the Core of Discovery Expedition. And their mission was to cross the newly acquired western per, uh, portion 
of the country right after the Louisiana Purchase. These guys took off in 1803, and you're about to know that the Louisiana Purchase took off, uh, was finalized right before that. I've touched upon this before, but I'm going to tell you again. The Louisiana Purchase, by the way, I spoke to an old friend of mine yesterday, Scott McCarthy. Scott, I went to college with him. I love Scotty more than anything. He lives out in uh, L.A., and since I'm going out for the race. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm going out for Clash Coliseum. This is going to be for sale in the Barstool store. If people are watching this on YouTube, I got this hot-ass Barstool racing thing. I mean, that's kind of cool, no? I designed this little, myself. little Hot Wheels logo? It looks a little bit like the yeah. Hot Wheels logo. Not exactly, Not though, for the people same. who are wondering. <laughs> but anyway, that's going <laughs> A couple the differences. Enough yeah, of a, little, a difference. Little nuances. But um, So I spoke to him, and he was telling me how his kids – by the way, he's like, – his one kid is about to play football, like Wash U. His other kid's playing lacrosse up in Colby. The other kid's like a freshman in high school. Everyone's getting so goddamn old. But uh, so him and his kids listen to this. So it's a pretty good shout out for him. And I said I'm going to do uh, Lewis and Clark this week, and I'm going to do the uh, Louisiana Purchase. And Scott had said Louisiana Purchase was the greatest real estate deal in the history of the United States. That's what he just said to me. I've never put it that way. It is the greatest real estate deal that ever happened in the history of the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's not even fucking close, right? So I'm going to go through it, okay? The Louisiana Territory, not Louisiana, assholes. The Louisiana Territory had many owners, and it was so fucking big that parts of it were simply just a jump ball for whoever wanted to stake a claim there. First, it was owned by the indigenous people, obviously, Everything was owned by the indigenous people, and they got the fucking shaft. I apologize. Then the French came in around 1682, way back, 1682. And then the land actually changed hands from France to Spain for just under 40 years. In between the Treaty of Fontainebleau, by the way, I'm going to do a lot of uh, French, I'm gonna do, and I'm going to nail it. Uh, yeah. Fontainebleau in 1762 until Spain relinquished the Louisiana ter Territory and New Orleans back to Napoleon's France via the Treaty of San Ildefonso. That was in 1800. So outside of a 40-year gap between the indigenous people having it and the United States having it, it was basically owned by France. And when we wanted to have it, the person who was in control of it was Napoleon. Napoleon obviously wasn't a king, but he was a big-time um, big time general. So, Indians, French, Spain, French again, and now the French under Napoleon, right? Yep. Along comes Thomas Jefferson. Ever heard of him? Thomas Jefferson was the president of the United States at the time, and his secretary of state was a guy named James Madison. They decided to fashion an alliance with the French government. Part and parcel of this relationship was the future governance of the Louisiana Territory. We had a we had a uh, a uh, like almost an unspoken agreement that we were able to use like waterways and whatnot that typically or that technically uh, were contained within the Louisiana Territory. Thomas Jefferson saw that those things were so tenuous, particularly with the, all the wars that were going on between the French and the English and stuff, that he needed to shore up this territory in order for us to grow as a country. Not everybody was on board with it, but that's why he had then gone to try and purchase the Louisiana Territory. Eventually, they negotiated the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, a deal that included a huge 828,000, I'm going to say that again, 828,000 square miles. That's, that's big, almost a million square miles of territory that includes New Orleans and nearly the whole Mississippi River value, uh, Valley. And they did it for fifteen million. That's eighteen dollars per square mile. We did that. We did the math on that. About eighteen dollars per square mile. Eight hundred and twenty-eight thousand square miles. Large. You could have said a billion square miles. You could have said a trillion. You could have said two hundred thousand. I don't understand how big that is. Right. By the way, that fifteen million was actually only eleven and a quarter million plus the forgiveness of three point seven five million in French debt. But I'm going to stay with fifteen million just to keep things straight. Right. Mm -hmm. So the Louisiana Purchase bought us not only what we know as the state of Louisiana, but what was the Louisiana Territory. Louisiana, the state, is bullshit. The whole state is fucking. I love the state. I love the people in it. I love saying New Orleans correctly now. The whole state is bullshit. It's only about 53,000 square miles. It's the 19th smallest state by area 
and the 25th most populous of the 50 states. So it's right in the middle. It's not Texas. It's not California. It's not some fucking mammoth state. It kind of is just mediocre. It's a, a boot. It's a Louisiana. Boot. It's 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 Louis. I mean, it's not Delaware either. It's not Rhode Island. Yeah. But it's nothing special. So we didn't pay 15 million for Louisiana because and their their mediocre 53,000 square miles. We bought 828,000 square miles. That land. Stretches from the Delta, Northwest, all the way to fucking Canada. So we're going manifest destiny from the Gulf of Mexico to the Canadian border now. Okay? So Louisiana, all of it. We got a little bit of Texas, a little bit of New Mexico, a little bit of Minnesota, a little bit of Colorado, most of North Dakota, most of Wyoming, most of Montana, all of Missouri, all of Arkansas, all of Kansas, all of Nebraska, all of South Dakota, and all of Iowa. That's unbelievable. If you were to go out in the street and say to somebody, hey, have you ever been to the Louisiana Territory? I'm saying that 75% of people would say no because they think that they would mean the state where New Orleans is. Have you ever been to Louisiana? I have. You've been to Louisiana? I've right. been to I, thought you, I thought your name would be. You're, you're, would you have been to Louisiana? Would what? Have you ever been to Louisiana? Yes, we just did the twisted. Uh, twisted oh yeah, we were down world. there together. Shit, that's right. That was you. <laughs> that, that was, was girlfriend. Me. Yeah, yeah. I think most people <laughs> who haven't been to Louisiana definitely have been to Louisiana territory, right? Because mm-hmm. it's oh. a whole middle of of the United States. Absolutely. I just don't think they know that that's the Louisiana territory. So, yeah, we had the the thirteen original colonies. This is technically fourteen colonies. If right, you right. Include parts of yes. states as a whole. So, so it's four, huge. We had 14. Compa- so we just mm-hmm. doubled, more than doubled our size. But am I crazy? Am I putting too fine a point on this? Did you graduate grammar school thinking that the Louisiana Purchase purchased Louisiana? I did. No. no I did. No. I did. I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't think know. Maybe the I'm an asshole. Know. Okay. I think it's like just, it's kind of like how many kids think that Alaska is southwest oh, of was, texas that was that's, stunning that's, i that's asked my kids next level stu- stupid i asked my kids the, how many uh, like <laughs> of their friends like their friends and i will tell you how it is unbelievable not my kids my mm-hmm. kids know it's unbelievable how many kids think that alaska is next to hawaii yeah oh i, I bet that's the way it's put into a map right? yeah, they yeah. cut it out and put it 100 percent. 100 yeah so I, another I, thing that teachers just overlook they don't they just assume right. they're going to know and they, yeah kids yeah don't. But I get I get a kid mistaking the Louisiana purchase yeah, 100%. for just Louisiana. But right. it, but if you but if they listen to this now, yeah, yeah. they won't make that mistake. And now fifteen million for all that. That's a deal. It wasn't a deal then. It it almost bankrupted us. It's a steal, yeah. Yeah, well, it, it almost b- bankrupted us. We took out so much dough on it, so we had to borrow. We had to borrow money to uh, to get this thing done. I have I have it somewhere. I have it somewhere about the uh, purchase. We had to borrow money to get this done, and we were paying it back for years. And by the time we paid it back, that fifteen million had turned to twenty-three. But still, an absolute, you know, deal, right? It, right. Twenty-three it, million dollars. You can, I can, I can't buy a, a mansion in the Hamptons for that. And at the time, right? And at the time, I don't think they under. At the time, I know they didn't understand how big this was. Yeah, yeah. Like, people were making fun of Thomas Jefferson for spending all this money on all this land. Like, what they the fuck him. are we doing? And again, it wasn't that Manifest Destiny type thing. They were like, no, there can be a border. There can be a border where somebody else owns land on the other side of it. As the United States, as the you know the first country in grow, we don't need to own this thing. We don't need to go see the Shining Sea. Mm-hmm. And as a result, like James Madison went into the poorhouse. He like had to sell his silverware. Honest to God, like this thing bankrupted a lot of people. But thank God that it happened. And by the way. Napoleon, his two brothers had tried to talk sense in him. Like, Napoleon's two brothers were like, uh, are you fucking kidding me? They, they, do not do this. This is a terrible deal. One of the brothers who had con- <laughs> confronted him face to face while Napoleon was taking a bath, Napoleon splashed him. That was that was oh. the story. His brother's like, don't do this fucking Napoleon. He said, get the fuck out of here. He splashed him. Brother's like, fine, do it. You know, like, and he walked out and slammed the door. Go ahead, sell off most of the United <laughs> See, States. Can't. Yeah, yeah. So that happened. So again, so if you're going to take away the Louisiana purchase, it's noted it had nothing to do with Louisiana. It had something to do with the Louisiana territory, which was massive, which was vast, and which the French had originally claimed for a gentleman named King Louis the Fourteenth, King Louis Quatorze, and uh, King Louis is Louisiana. That's that's the whole thing. So that whole territory is about King Louis. I am going to go on a left turn. 
I, when I started doing this podcast with you, Vibs, I like to go on left turns about individuals. I'm going on a left turn about King Louis. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, Louis nor Clark. I don't care. Yeah. Louis the Couture's was fucking fascinating. Is this the Sun King? He's the Sun King. We, we got this question right on trivia one we did time. we absolutely yep, did we yeah. crushed that yeah king king louis uh the 13th louis trez he's the guy that the cognac's named after uh, after right there's like a three thousand dollar bottle of cognac that's made by remy martin i've had it sometimes it's more than three thousand dollars it's that 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 iconic uh iconic uh bottle with the spikes on it and um so they have all these different cask ages of it and all that mm-hmm. kind of shit so i had one um a buddy of mine who owns a restaurant, Mario at Arturo, shout out. He had had it in the thing. He just poured us small glasses. It was myself, Willie. I think Francis was there and stuff. So we tried it, Louis Trez. And I never had it before. It was. Just, it's just like a high-end cognac. I don't have the palate to appreciate it, but I've had it. That was Louis Couture's fa- uh, father. So uh, Louis Trez to Louis Couture's. So Louis Couture's, Louis the Fourteenth. He's also known as Louis the Great, Louis Le Grand. What's up? He's also known as the Sun King, Le Roi Soleil. What's up? No? Nothing for that? So hot. He was the King of France from May 1643, when he was just four years old, until his death in 1715 at the age of 76, which means he was the monarch of France for 72 years and 110 days. And that's the longest recorded of any monarch of a sovereign country sovereign country in history. So he was given the crown when his dad died when he was only four years old. And he kept it until he died 76. He was in charge what? 72 years. That's a, little, that's a little fact. Yeah. Queen Elizabeth is close on his heels, right? I, yeah. How long has she been in there? So at the time of taping, today is January 19th, 2022. Mm-hmm. Uh, that old bitch is just shy of... Of 70 years in office. She's right on his fucking heels. She's ripe. Right on his heels. And she's, and <laughs> so 70 years in office for Queen Elizabeth. So keep in mind, 72 for Louis XIV, 70 years for Queen Elizabeth. That's making her easily the longest reigning incumbent monarch. The only guy who's in office, guy, uh, guy or girl who's in office right now, the longest reigning incumbent is her with a bullet at 70 years. And also, by far the longest reigning documented female monarch in history. She's the balls as far as fucking, she's the Cal Ripken of female monarchs, except Cal Ripken actually worked, right? She's just <laughs> yeah, the world's yeah. highest paid mascot, right? Golden diapers, my, my, fuck her. If you, if you, this is a, a left turn. Go ahead. On our Christmas tree, we have two ornaments. It is Cal Ripken Jr. and Grant Hill. In the year 1997, my dad wanted my brother and I to be those two guys. Like, really? Just put those guys together, and that's what he wanted us to be. We played basketball, we played baseball. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the Iron Man King, 100%. Cal Ripken, is, is very high up on the list. I met, at the I met Grant test. Hill when he was at Duke, and I was at uh, I was in college at the same time. That's when I met him first. And the shoulders on that guy, like, you couldn't understand it when you used to watch him, you know, on TV. But he was... You know, it's like seeing Peyton Manning in, in, in person. He's a fucking monster. Mm-hmm. Grant Hill was, like, sculpted, particularly in college. And then he got his, like, NBA body, got even stronger. But <laughs> so Queen Elizabeth is in office for 70 years, hot on the trail of Louis the Fourteenth. But they need to keep her 95-year-old ass propped up on the throne for another two and a half years to beat him. And that's how the only way she'd beat Louis the Fourteenth. I'm hoping to be doing this podcast for the next two years. I'm hoping to be doing the podcast for the next two years. With three G. I'm it's taking possible. the under. Oh, I'm d- oh I don't no. think she beats him. If Do she you th- dies, I'm going around the room this right. This episode and next you... week. I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. I'm gonna lucky the shit out of her. I don't. I. Oh. I think that she's. I think her and her whole family are pieces of shit. I have no fucking. I do not care. But honestly. Because I do she's not such clear. a piece of shit, do you think she's immune to these curses? Like, 100%. I don't think she can die. I think, yeah. she's, I think she's... Believe me, there has been nations that have been wishing for her to bite it. She's bulletproof. For, she, yeah. Nothing's going to happen yeah. to her. I take the under on her beating Louis the Fourteenth. How about you, Annie? Oh, I don't know. Does she beat him or no? I, it's going to be I documented. I think so until you brought her up now and you got this curse You're thing You're saying going. no. Vibs? I think she is one of those old people that is just hanging on this is the one that, thing yeah. that she has and she will not stop fighting until she has surpassed Understood. the sun king well, okay. i don't think she's ever really thought about it we John should ask to. her I'm yeah, we ask put John it out to. there okay because i don't think she's thought about it in these terms so <laughs> yeah. maybe once she knows 
that what she's up against, she might, you know, I'll she see. might, I'll she see. might be a little stronger than Betty White. She yeah. knows she has. We're huge in England. We we are. I don't know yeah. if you guys know this, but we're huge and growing. In England. I mean, so the British fun. have the French on their radar all the time. 100%. I feel like they hate each yeah. right. They're, they've always been buttonheads. They hate, so she's, they, they hate the I French. Think she's, well, they love twisted history. Yes. <clears throat> Give her the opportunity is. to take out somebody in France. I right? said, you know what? We might have a shot. I said Louis was only four when he became king because the 13th died at the age of 41 in 1643. So the monarchy passed to his eldest child, Louis the 14th, who was just four years and eight months old and had to rule over a kingdom that had 19 million subjects. That's substantial. You're four years old. <laughs> you know, the crowd doesn't fit you. It's kind of adorable to think about. So he's 19 million uh, subjects. So his mother and his godfather slash chief minister, a guy by the name of Cardinal Jules Mazarin, did most of the heavy lifting while uh, Louis was a child. I don't think he was uh, officially coronated where they would put the crown on him and all that stuff until he was closer to 21. Mm-hmm. So he was four. Technically, he was king since he was four. And uh, but this guy, the cardinal and his mom um, were kind of in charge. The rest I'm going to do is bullets. And the bullets are pretty interesting. So after it took nearly decades, nearly two decades before they could birth a child, Louis's parents christened him Louis Douadon, meaning gift of God. So his parents called him a gift of God because it took 20 years to have him. And both his mother and the chief minister, this guy Mazarin, I'm going to say his name is going to be Mazarin or Mazarin. I'm going to say Mazarin. Fuck it. Yep. Instilled in him the impression that kings are divinely chosen. As a result, Louis XIV adopted the sun as his emblem, associating himself with the Greek and Roman sun god Apollo. And like the planets revolve around the sun, which we all know, Louis XIV believed that France revolved around him. So no shortage of confidence in Louis XIV. His first wife was also his second cousin. I love saying shit like that. Marie Therese of Spain. Marie Therese gave birth to six of the king's children, but only one, Louis Jr., survived past the age of five. Louis XIV, however, fathered more than a dozen illegitimate children outside of his marriage with a number of different mistresses. Mistress Louise de Lavalier, a Ken, fucking pured that, bore five of the king's children, only two of which survived infancy, while her rival, Madame de Montespan, who eventually became the king's chief mistress, gave birth to seven of the monarch's children, and Louis eventually legitimized most of his children born to mistresses in the years following their births. He legitimized them, but they never were giving any kind of step towards the throne. Right, you're my kid, but you're not my heir. Bastard Didn't have to children. do it. Yeah, yeah, they were John Snows. Yeah, they were John Snows. So, and he had a bunch of them, but he did have one kid with his wife, and his kid's name was Louis. Also, what a title, oh, King's yeah. Chief Mistress. Oof, Love that. Be nice. Yeah. yeah. You know what? You are. You're my, you're, my, you're my chief mistress. After something called the Fronde, which was a series of civil wars within France, this isn't the French Revolution. That's going to come along much later. But after the Fronde, which was a, a sib, uh, just a series of civil wars. Uh, Louis XIV officially moved his court from Paris to a former hunting lodge that he had transformed into a lavish 700-room palace that we now know as Versailles, which is about 13 miles outside of the city. So every tradesman, if you worked with marble, if you worked with wood, if you worked with paint, if you worked with anything, you were brought... 13 miles outside of Paris for nearly 20 years, and you built the Palace of Versailles for Louis XIV because he no longer liked Paris. He was in Paris when the shit got weird, so he wanted to get the fuck out. And from 1671 until his death in 1715, Louis never slept a night in Paris again. Right? That's a guy who knows what he wants, and he got the hell out of Dodge. That's probably why he lasted so long. 29, 39, 43 years. Right, because it took a while to build his palace. Forty-three years, Louis Quatorze, Louis the Fourteenth, never slept a night in Paris. Versailles is beautiful. Mm-hmm. Like Versailles is as beautiful as a place that you'd ever want to go to. And he has been there, and it's it's stunningly beautiful. And let's put people in the right head. Like we're trying to tell you, we're not you know in the Depression or during Prohibition. Set late seventeen hundreds France was a good time to be um, part of the aristocracy. Mm -hmm. It was like the powdered wigs. 
and the girls in the bustiers pushing them up, you know what I mean? And the big dresses and whatnot. And Marie Antoinette yes. had not even come along yet. Mm-hmm. Marie Antoinette would be after Louis XIV. Yeah. And it, you know, and then it didn't wind up well for her. But, like, so this is pre revolution. If you were in the aristocracy in France, that's what I want. It's a sweet spot. Yeah. Oh, I gout. I, I get gout reading about it. If you're on a good side. <laughs> if you were a peasant in France around that time, believe me, it wasn't cool. You always had like a wart. You yeah. always see these people. Yeah. Like, yeah, you always a ward. Like, right. You have a lot of brown clothes. Yeah. yeah. But I, I mean, the parties at Versailles were nuts. People were dressed to the nines. The dresses and corsets worn by women in the court of Louis XIV were so cumbersome and difficult to get out of because they had those like whalebone corsets and shit mm-hmm. and those big. It reminds me of that scene in um, uh, Bridesmaids. So these girls were in these like. <laughs> Big, beautiful dresses at these parties in this gigantic place, Versailles, that all of a sudden, if the if nature called, they would basically go down an abandoned hallway. Beautiful abandoned hallway. Still marble and Michelangelo pissing vodka or whatever the hell yeah. it was. And they would just take shits in the corner. Like, they would just take their underwear off, take shits in the corner, and just I leave them there. I don't they necessarily wore any. Yeah, so did perhaps they, they didn't have any uh, bloomers. Did they have, like, an assistant in the bathroom? I don't like, know. Hey. Like, I think it would just be one of those yeah. things where you go, you let it go. So it's documented that the night after parties in Versailles, the people who were the servants there would have to go around to various hallways, just clean up uh, piles of human excrement. Disgusting. Oh, I think you that's know wonderful. That, I would love you know, to You know, you say like, disgusting. Common practice, though. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, what Which else are you going to do? Yeah. You know, like, I mean, but you know those big, poofy ball gowns were getting... Do do on them. Yeah, you had. I to. mean, you can't. I well, no, I don't know. I it's hard to control it. I don't know. I don't. I. You know what? I don't know either. But I find it fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I find it fascinating that the top of French society was taking shits in marble fucking hallways while Louis was next door, like kind of giggling, like the Amadeus. So Louis, if you ever see any of the uh, paintings that he commissioned about himself, and there are plenty. So not paintings that weren't him, but mm-hmm. paintings of Louis the Fourteenth. One of the things that he loved about himself was uh, his legs. So he'd always have his legs in like white stockings with the buckled shoes with the big heels. And he always has his legs sticking out. If you Google paintings of Louis XIV, he has his legs sticking out. Beautiful legs. Yeah. But otherwise, he was one of those guys that would like, right? Look at yeah. the gaps I mean, on him, he's right? He's a tall drink of water. Yeah, absolutely. And he was one of those guys that would sit at tables. And the kitchen to his dining room was a quarter mile away. So, like, his food was, like, brought out in a procession, a quarter-mile procession. I like the feeling of that. I like the feeling of what France was like for rich people around that time. He also owned the Hope Diamond. He was – sorry. No, was, go ahead. He was 6'4". He was a tall drink of water. That's what they say. He was 6'4", but they weren't sure if it was because of his heels. Yeah. That's that, what they say. That, his heels and his wig. That's like an NBA roster <laughs> Yes, exactly. Height. It's like yeah. eh, he's more like six feet tall. Right, right. Because I'm 6'5", and I know I'm majestic. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I'm – oh, that's barefoot, baby. Barefoot and no wigs. You know mm-hmm. me. I'm, I'm clean as the day I was born. So, uh, <laughs> so I don't know. I, I put an asterisk next to the 6'4 thing. Um, so he that. owned the Hope Diamond. Mm-hmm. What's the Hope Diamond? If you ever saw Titanic, that's what they thought the Hope Diamond was. It's, uh, the Hope Diamond was never on the Titanic. That's all bullshit. But the Hope Diamond has been around for a very long time. It was called French Blue back when Louis Couture's had it. And when he had it, it weighed over 67 carats. That's a lot. If anyone's ever bought an engagement ring or, or a wedding ring, you know what 67 carats is. No, you don't. Right? Get a carrot and a half for your wife, and all of a sudden it's two months. Like that, that whole thing. 67 carats is a whopper when Louis had it. But it's been cut down by its various owners to what it's now, 45 and a half carats. And it's in the Smithsonian in Washington. It was never on the Titanic. It was the Hope Diamond. They say it was cursed, right? Because I believe it was lost during the French Revolution. Marie Antoinette might have had it when they cut her head off. I, I don't know. But the Hope Diamond used to belong to Louis Fourteenth. He died at 77. Right, he died at 77 on August 13, 1715, a few weeks after complaining about a pain in one of his beautiful legs. He became seriously overweight in his old age, and his left leg turned gangrenous. Oh. So that's how he had died. Gangrene's not a good way to die, and that's how he had died. His corpse was divided into three parts: his body, his heart, and his entrails which was a tradition for French kings that started several centuries earlier. They didn't just bury you. They buried you, 
and they entombed your body, and then they split up your heart and your entrails, and they kept them elsewhere, normally in certain churches and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So they did the same thing for him. His body was buried, his heart and his entrails were somewhere else. Louis' heart was embalmed and placed in a glace de Jesuites on Rue Saint Antoine in Paris, nailing all these things. So that's where his heart was. However, during the French Revolution, the Sun King's heart was stolen, and it ended up in the possession of someone named Lord Harcourt, the Archbishop of York, which is kind of cool. And Lord Harcourt, the Archbishop of York, had a dinner party where he invited a gentleman named William Buckland, this Englishman named William Buckland, over. So he visited Harcourt in 1848, and he learned that uh, the Archbishop had the mummified heart of the Sun King. He said, can I see it? He saw it, he took it, and he ate it. Just gulped it down. And I'll explain that. Buckland was a freak. He was a geologist. He was a paleontologist. He was a zoologist. But he was known as a man who wanted to eat everything. Buckland's favorite snack was something called mice on toast. It's kind of self-explanatory. He also ate porpoise. He ate panther. He ate dog. He ate sea slugs. He ate kangaroo. And he ate moles. His ultimate goal was to taste every animal on earth. And I get it. Right? I, I get it. And it's not apples to, to apples, do. but like I drank the cognac of Louis Trez, mm -hmm. like, you know, because I wanted a connection. No biggie. Yeah. Very expensive, but, you know, like, so the whole thing. So Buckland tasted the limestone wall of an Italian cathedral just to disprove the legend that it was imbued with the, um, with the blood of saints. They said that this limestone wall used to get damp from the blood of saints. So this guy said, no, no, I'll go. Buckland yeah. went over there, started licking the wall, and his culinary expertise concluded that it wasn't Saint's blood, but it was bat urine instead. Ah, yeah, yeah, bat piss. That's, that's yeah. how COVID started. <laughs> so then when this weirdo was at a dinner party, the mummified heart of a legendary French king was put in front of it. He popped it like a McNugget. Mm. The mummified heart had shrank to about the size of a walnut by the time Buckland got to see it. It was 1848, so that was over 130 years this thing was just shriveling. Makes sense. So, yeah, so, I mean, to have it down probably wasn't his whole heart. So to have it go down to a mummified uh, walnut, like the toe that we spoke about. Right. The, up in the Yukon. The drink. Yeah, you got to do it toes. You got to tuck the toe. Yeah. So this guy popped it, and that was it. Um, so Louis the Fourteenth, one of the most, I'll say it, iconic kings ever of France, died 130 years later. His heart was eaten by an eccentric British dude. Like, I, I, I don't know. After Louis' death, just to keep that theme going, I think he had already, like, his, he had already survived his kids. So the throne went to his great-grandson, who was then crowned Louis XV, and his great-grandson was only five when he took over the throne. So Louis came in when he was four. His great-grandson took over for him when he was five. And Louis the Fifteenth had went on to govern France for the next 59 years. So that's, that's, that's a nice run. Mm -hmm. From the 13th through the 15th, and then after the 15th, we're going to get into the French Revolution, which I'm done. I'm done with Louis the Fourteenth right now. You get into the French, and things start to get hairy. But the Louis... It had a nice little run in there. Was it like 120 years for the two? Yeah, yeah. what the hell not, right? Well, I wonder if it's better to be a king when you're four years old or if it's better to come into being a king when you're 30. Yeah, because you don't know what you have, you're saying. Yeah, yeah, because if you're, if you're four... You've never you, had a callus. All you, all you know is being a king. Yeah. And if you're like 30, you're like, okay, well, you know a different life. I don't know. I yeah. Don't, I think about... Yeah. I don't I'm, think there's an answer to that. Well, no, I mean, there is, right? I, if you go to... Uh, uh, coming to America. That gives you the answer. Yes. Right? Like Great. Eddie Murphy. <laughs> Did you watch the second one? I haven't seen the second I one. I heard it was absolutely Okay, garbage. yeah. I haven't, I haven't gotten I, I, the courage yeah. to watch the second one. I will not one. do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? All right. So that was a little bit of a tangent. I apologize. I don't apologize. But that's Louis XIV. Everyone should know about him. He's very, very fascinating. Okay? The reason I mentioned Louis XIV is because Louisiana was named after him. And the way that I was yelling about it, apparent Louisiana <laughs> territory is near and dear to my heart. Back to the purchase. So now we're in America. Thomas Jefferson is president. We have all this fucking land, but we have no idea what's inside of it or how to get across it. By the way, when Jefferson thought that these guys, before he did the, the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition, he thought that there were woolly mammoths still in the United States. He thought they were going to run into woolly mammoths. It was crazy. You had no idea. So now you buy all this land. 
this amorphous boundary that's ma- mainly uh, rivers. Like, so the rivers were the boundaries. A lot of this was done by canoe. You, you, you might, know? yeah, you're right. So well, thought they were going to run into woolly mammoths. I mean, they might as well have been sending these guys to the moon. Yeah. They were gone for three 100%. years, and there was no contact with, like, Washington, D.C. or Jefferson. They could have been dead, and they would never know. There was no Morse code. There was no telephone, uh, mail, smoke signal, or anything. So when these guys were gone, you just waited. Mm-hmm. You just waited. <laughs> yeah. And it's also like, it's not like they went to the West Coast, saw the Pacific, and lit off a flare to let everyone know that they made it. They didn't have to turn around and come home. Mm-hmm. You know, like a, yeah. So that's that's what I'm trying to say too. Like we talk about studs and we talk about explorers and people mentioned Lewis and Clark. This was huge. This was a, this was a huge thing. So we have all this idea. We have all this land. No idea. So Jefferson taps two guys to explore and to map the newly acquired territory to find a practical route across the western half of the continent and to establish an American presence in this territory before European powers attempted to establish claims in this region, particularly the Spanish, who were coming up from Mexico. Right. So, so we were looking to beat the Spanish. So Thomas. So we're trying to beat the Spanish. So Thomas Jefferson has to pick the cream of the crop. You would think. Right? You would absolutely think. There was also a secondary objective, uh, objective and that was uh, more scientific. They had to study plants and animal, le- and mm-hmm. animal uh, species, which I was like, that's kind of adorable. But if you Google... Um, you know, uh, Lewis and Clark expedition, what what happened? It, it all depends on what you click on. They will say, oh, Lewis and Clark expedition is how we know about the three-toed sloth. How we don't, they did a lot of that stuff. So Lewis's journals describe 178 previously unknown species of plants. So he documented nearly 200 new plants. That's so uninteresting to me, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I give a shit less about that, it, but he had to do it. And 122 new animals, including coyotes. No one ever saw a fucking coyote. Mountain beavers, which I think sounds fucking awesome, mm-hmm. and grizzly bears. Imagine seeing a grizzly bear for the first fucking time. Terrifying. It's like the Mexicans when he came on, on ships and they thought they were floating islands. What the fuck do you do when you see a, a grizzly bear? You know what I mean? It's like the first guy who ate an oyster. Could be the bravest guy I've ever heard of. You do me a favor, sweetheart, and close that window. I'm freezing my balls off. I apologize. I got it. I got it. I got yeah, yeah. So who's he going to send? That's what Vib says. He's going to do the cream of the crop. Kind of. In 1795, there was a 21-year-old guy. His name is Meriwether Lewis. And he was court-martialed because he got drunk and he challenged a lieutenant to a duel. A little bit of a you know beer muscle guy. Yeah. I, I don't judge. He was found not guilty of the charges, but his superiors decided to transfer him to a different rifle company to avoid any future incidents. And his new commander turned out to be none other than a guy named William Clark. So Meriwether Lewis got drunk, challenged his superior to a duel, wound up getting thrown in prison for it, found not guilty, transferred, and he got transferred under the rule of a guy named Clark, Lewis and Clark. I, I, I like Meriwether Lewis. you got to have someone with a little bit of edge to I send like out there. Little moxie. Yeah, you're sending them into the wilderness. 100%. He's got to be a man. In 1801, Lewis left the Army, and he accepted an invitation to serve as Thomas Jefferson's presidential secretary. It winds up that Meriwether Lewis knew Thomas Jefferson since he was a boy. He'd grown up on a Virginia plantation only a few miles from Monticello. And the pair went on to forge a Vibs Large esque, I like to say that, relationship while working together in the White House. I'd like to think that I'm Thomas Jefferson. I'd like to think I'll, you're Meriwether Lewis. Are you cool with I'll that? I'll take that in a second. In a yeah. heartbeat, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, not, that's not embarrassing. No, Thomas Thomas Jefferson, great head of hair, a little ponytail. Yeah, uh, shit. But, but that hurts. He just was, he was too. Um, Uptight? Too cultured for me. I'm, a, I'm more of a, hey, let's let's light a fire and drink some beer, boys. 100%. Yeah. I <laughs> want to see the other side of the United States. You, I don't want to go. You would love to go. I would over- love if you said, hey, Lodge, I'll go, and I'll tell you all about it. Yes. But done. Meanwhile, you're taking shits with people in French hallways. Done. That's that's what Thomas that's, Jefferson that's loved. exactly what I want to do. Yeah. Slave owner, too. Yes. Everyone yeah. knows that. Um, not saying that I'm more slave ownerish of the two of us. Gonna, yeah. Just dropping that as an aside. But I'm Thomas <laughs> Jefferson. You're Meriwether Lewis. I'm going to say John is William Clark. I, I got to give John something. Okay. So. That's fair. The total exp. So when and Jefferson. Aunt, sorry. Anne is Sacagawea. 100% yeah. Sacagawea. Yeah. yeah. 100%. Did you ever get so, those Sacagawea gold coins? I have a, I have a bunch. Oh. Uh. They were bet the bet. I was kidding. Greatest, you know, right? I remember paying for a terrarium with like six Sacagawea gold coins at some when I was like eight. It said I, that Sacagawea has more statues built in her honor than any other American woman. That's pretty cool. 
I mean, that's just like a little thing, and I guess there's no way to know if it's true or not. Maybe mm-hmm. there's a couple of Tubmans laying around nobody knows about. But Sacagawea is supposed to be number one with a bullet as far as having statues dedicated right. to her. Right. Basically saved these two and had a baby the whole time on her back. 100%. Think about that for a second. Uh-huh. Imagine giving birth and taking this baby on a on a. We can't. Like to, to, to stick You're the only one here with any kind of yeah. uh, Well, to stick with it. the moon, uh, what is it? Uh, the moon, the, the, sun moon, God the guy? moon thing. Like, no, these guys are going to the moon. Oh, imagine, yeah, sure. <laughs> imagine going to the moon and having a baby. And you Seriously, have no doctors right? and stuff. Yeah, it's the same. Right. Uh, with with modern medicine. I mean, when you go to the moon and have a baby. Metaphor. That's what I was looking When you go to the moon and have a baby, somebody can still boil water and get some clean sheets. They're cutting fucking umbilical cords with sharp rocks. And if you right? think about it, she kind of orchestrated this this wonderful real estate purchase. I'm gonna give her I'm gonna give her her due. I swear no, to I God, Sacagawea will get her I due. I refuse to believe that it wasn't the men on this trip that did. She's do the that. ultimate badass. If you think about yeah, it. Yeah, she's she was she was the shit. So when Jefferson decided to launch this expedition all the way to the west in 1802, he immediately named Lewis, just like I would name Vibs, as its commander. And then Lewis, Vibs, immediately chose his close friend and very handsome William Clark, Johnny LBI, Johnny San Diego, <laughs> right? Johnny San Diego to be his second in command. So the total expedition party included 45 people. That's including Lewis and Clark, 27 unmarried soldiers, a French Indian interpreter, a contracted boat crew, and a slave. They had one slave with them. So William Clark had a slave, a personal slave, and he was a big black guy named York, and he came along with them. Sacagawea was not part of the expedition when it started, and that's probably news to a lot of people. So when they left uh, St. Louis in 1803, Mm -hmm. Sacagawea was not on board. Here's another left turn. To prepare for the trip, in early 1803, Thomas Jefferson sent Meriwether Lewis to Philadelphia under the tutelage of a gentleman named Benjamin Rush, who was a, Benjamin Rush was a stud. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was a respected physician in Philadelphia. And Rush taught Lewis about frontier illnesses and the performance of bloodletting. And Rush ultimately provided the Corps with a medical kit that included the following things. I said, I said Benjamin Rush was a stud. I'm going to take that back. Benjamin Rush was a very popular figure. He was a founding father and whatnot. But I'm going to get to the bottom of Benjamin Rush right now. So everybody who was going on the Lewis and Clark expedition had a pack from Benjamin Rush. Mm-hmm. Inside that pack, you had Turkish opium for nervousness. That was their 3G. I'm on this trip already. Boom. I'm ready. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. That's great. We could just smoke opium all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking great. Just go down the river smoking opium? That sounds like a blast. 100%. Sounds like a vacation. And medics. You had emetics to induce vomiting. You had medicinal wine. We spoke about medicinal wine. A pope one time had, uh, had, had was on a fucking ad for medicinal wine. So I'm smoking opium. I uh, don't have to do the finger sandwiches to throw up. It could take some emetics. Mm-hmm. I'm drinking medicinal wine. And finally, he gave every, uh, so a total of 50 dozen, I think that's 600, of Dr. Rush's bilious pills were sent with the expedition. So 600 of these pills. They were laxatives. These laxatives contained three main ingredients. One of them was something called jalap. Jalap is an herbal laxative taken from the roots of a Mexican climbing plant. Okay, a laxative has jalap in it. Jalap is a natural laxative. Mm -hmm. The second ingredient was chlorine. Yikes. The third ingredient, which made up 50% of each one of these pills, was something called mercury. Mercury is no bueno. Right, you have too much tuna at the sushi place, then you could fucking die. Some lady almost died from having too much sushi at a buffet this week. The pills were commonly known as thunderclappers because they brought the thunder to your asshole. I'm, so I'm pretty ahead. sure there was a, a point where uh, Dave Portnoy got mercury poisoning because he was eating sushi every single day, yep. and then his eye like swelled up. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Mercury poisoning is a big deal. Yeah. These guys had 600 pills, half of the pills. And each one of the pills, 50% of them were, um, uh, each pill was 50% mercury, 25% chlorine, and 25% of Mexican uh, laxative. None of that. That's crazy. It is good. It's 100% crazy. So um, the explorers had like a meat-rich diet, and they had a lack of clean water during the expedition. That's what they expected, and that was going to cause constipation. And Rush, Benjamin Rush, Dr. Benjamin Rush, was a huge proponent 
of something back then called heroic medicine. Heroic medicine is also referred to as heroic depletion theory. It was a therapeutic method advocating for rigorous treatment of bloodletting, purging, and sweating to shock the body back to health after any type of illness caused an imbalance, a humoral imbalance, an imbalance of your humors. So Dr. Rush's answer to everything was out with the bad, right? And then modern medicine gave us more of an in with the good, right? Antibiotics and all this stuff. Right. So his answer to just about anything was, let me open up a vein, yeah. get some blood out of you, and that'll bring your humors, your chakras back in the thing. Don't, That's don't cold. worry, we'll shock your body back into health. Yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, uh, blankets dipped in vinegar, then put into a steam room. That was his thing. Emetics, throwing up, dire, um, laxatives, shitting yourself, blood, anything that would take stuff out. That's called yeah. heroic yeah. medicine. Yeah. Horrible, right? yeah. Horrible. That's all that regeneration. Yeah, heroic <laughs> depletion back. theory. You just take <laughs> shit out, out with the bed. Okay? Rush wrote that constipation is often a sign of approaching disease. So whenever one of these guys felt constipated, they should avoid disease and take one or more of my purging pills. That's what they wanted to do. And they worked. Not only did they clean the explorers out, their high mercury content providing an excellent tracer by which archaeologists have been able to track the core's actual route to the Pacific by measuring the spiked levels of mercury in the latrine pits they used along the way. I'll say that again, and a lot of people know this because they've mentioned it before on this show. Their shit was so toxic with mercury <laughs> that it was easily traceable. Like almost anybody with a Geiger, it was easily traceable 200 years later. So we were able to map out the exact route of Lewis and Clark because it wasn't like hang a left at the oak tree. There's no way to do it. Like, you know, Andy's letter to Red, you know, like that whole thing. The only way that they were able to make a true uh, map outside of the journals was to go around and measure mercury levels. And they found toxic latrine prints. 200 years later. That's fantastic, right? Imagine being on that expedition. Yeah. So now you're just following the latrine pits of Lewis and Clark, <laughs> just digging up shit. And, yeah. and like, that's that's, a, that's a weird expedition. Yeah, that's um, not sexy. And that's like your life work. That's, that's I could go on that one. Yeah. Right? I mean, be, it's, it's less dangerous. Like, yeah. I would do that. Oh, I do. You'd be I would Jefferson, do that. I'd be Lewis in that I'd one. do that in a second. Uh, Again, these mercury pills were invented by Benjamin Rush, a guy who signed a declaration, but a guy that existed in a time in the late 1700s where people had some fucking wacky ideas about science and medicine. I'm going to talk about him for a little while. I did a left turn on Louis XIV, a small left turn on Benjamin Rush. He was the medical consultant for the Lewis and Clark expedition, founding father, signed a declaration way before it was stolen by Nick Cage, right? Mm -hmm. He was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Ivy League school, and he went on to found Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Have you ever heard of Dickinson College? I've not. Let me tell you who the most notable alumnus of Dickinson College is. Number one with the bullet is James Buchanan. James Buchanan was the 15th president of the United States. He was the only president to be elected from Pennsylvania, and he was the only president to remain a lifelong bachelor. Buchanan, Dickinson College, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, founded by Dr. Benjamin Rush. Let me tell you about a couple other notable alumni, alumnuses, alumnus, Beck, guy who sang Loser, I'm mm -hmm. a loser, baby, Antonio Banderas. Wow. Wow, yeah. Huh? wow. yeah, and finally, I think everybody's favorite lesbian since Ellen had like that little hiccup, Rosie O'Donnell. Rosie O'Donnell is also a Dickinson college. And now think about that. She's a lesbian, but she went to Dickens, right? Like Dick is in. Why was Buchanan yep. single? I don't know. Uh, oh no, not a gay guy. I don't think so. Because when you're when you when you're the president and you're you're pulling in presidential pussy, oh, fuck you're, yeah. you're are you kidding me? That's the biggest oh, mistake. Office? That's yeah. the biggest mistake all these presidents have made going 100%. in with a first lady. Yeah, you got to go like in you single. You said earlier all these men went on this expedition. They were they were unmarried men. Of course they are, as they should be. Yeah, your wife's gonna have a problem if you're going to disappear into the wilderness That's for right. three years and not write her back. Mm. That's right. Exactly. I love the fact that. Uh, when we do this in real time, I just got a picture of a six pack of Saranac black cherry cream soda. Mm -hmm. I know this is the Isn't inside of my refrigerator. In your car right now? And that's uh, from Finnegan. Can I take one for the road? Oh, did he just <laughs> so, send that? Yeah, he I just, just sent back a, a text to him. <laughs> yes, sir, and a thank you. 
That is so <laughs> funny. I, the the I, Antonio I, Banderas thing is blowing my mind a little. Yeah, bit. I don't know. He's I want, a little I want, bit more culture. It's it's weird because James Buchanan went there. Sure, that's cool. Beck went there. Who gives a shit? I Rosie he was O'Donnell be like on a beach. makes sense. Rosie O'Donnell seems to be like she's a yinzer, like you know, like mm-hmm. somebody from like Pennsylvania or something. Antonio Banderas. Yeah, I was expecting him to have graduated from some place like you know, if he said Coastal Carolina, where it's like oh, everybody I, in I, I, Antonio like, Banderas. I didn't even think he went to college. He just he's just exotic and he just knows windsurfing. Yeah, the wind. Told yeah, him yeah, to yeah. The, the the break of the waves taught me how to fucking live. <laughs> I gotta put a pin in that. I researched a lot of this bullshit just to make sure. I'm, I gotta put a pin in whether or not Antonio Banderas really graduated. Might have been one of those honorary degrees where he got to do the, the <laughs> yes, commencement yes, speech or yes. something like that. So they gave him an honorary degree in like food services, which well, is a noble cause. Antonio Banderas. Oh, never mind. Oh, no, well, come back to me. So. So, but anyway, so the reason that I mentioned this, please, Benjamin Rush, who invented these poison pills and all this stuff, didn't poison anybody, but they were poisonous uh, going down the road, uh, had started this uh, college. He was a leader of the American Enlightenment, and the American Enlightenment, which basically brought about the American Revolution, right? So people all of a sudden become enlightened to what they were, all of a sudden made people want to break free from England, and that was the American Revolution. He opposed slavery, slavery bad. He advocated free public schools, education good, and he sought improved education for women and a more enlightened penal code, a penal system. So he, was, he wanted some rights for prisoners, uh, rights for women, uh, rights for blacks, and he wanted kids to get uh, educated for free. So the guy had a lot. He was also... Uh, recognizes the father of American psychiatry. In 1965, 150 years after his death, the American Psychiatric Association actually named him the father of American psychiatry. So he did a lot of good. But here are the not-so-positives. He made laxatives with mercury, right? That, that wasn't great. In 1792, he read a paper before the American Philosophical Society where he argued that the color and figure of blacks were, and this is, this is a quote, of blacks were derived from a form of leprosy. He argued with proper treatment, blacks could be cured and become white. That's fucking crazy. Yeah. He advocated bloodletting for almost any illness, <laughs> and he used other early heroic medical techniques that often were ineffective and actually brought many patients closer to their deathbed. So much so that some even blamed Russia's bleeding and bloodletting for hastening the death of a couple of guys you've heard of. Ben Franklin, George Washington, and Rush himself, who insisted upon being bled shortly before his death when he was only 67 years old. And we did a little bit of turn on George Washington once, and we know that one of the reasons George Washington had died is I think he gave like 40 quarts of blood in the last three days of his fucking life. Mm-hmm. So Benjamin Rush was at the forefront of bloodletting, and they said he probably killed more patients than he healed. So, so there we go. Not All ideal, right. So not ideal. Benjamin Rush did some great stuff, but Benjamin Rush was also crazier than a shit he's, out. He, what is it? What's, who's the coach? Jeff Fisher, who has like a 500 record. He's like the Jeff Fisher of he's, medicine. He's, 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 he's the he's, Jeff Fisher. He's, he's got more of the founding fathers. He's got about, signed a declaration. Yeah, I mean, I mean it had to be something. Yeah, I mean, Jeff Fisher's a respectable guy, but I mean, 100%. he's got probably he's got about the same amount of losses as wins. We said that Benjamin Rush was the founding uh, father of American psychiatry. I'm taking a break right now to talk about BetterHelp. So BetterHelp is on board with us. BetterHelp is a customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. I prefer to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. I'm going to give you the thing real quick. I'm telling you right now, if you're, if you're listening to this podcast – we talk about a lot of crazy shit. Mm-hmm. And again, Meriwether Lewis wound up perhaps taking his own life. There's no reason anymore in 2022 where people need to be in a situation where they can't talk shit out. So if you need to talk some shit out, particularly with somebody that you don't know, that's what I think the benefit of, of therapy is. An unbiased source. You don't, you don't know them. Because right. if, I, if I love my wife more than anything else in the world... I still can't tell her everything. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I, like there's there's certain things that you just embarrassed of. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, your mom, your best friend. There's certain things that you just embarrassed of, and maybe some of it has to do with your mom or your best friend or your wife that's driving you fucking crazy. Don't take that personally, but it happens. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So having that outside thing is 
is priceless, and BetterHelp provides you that, and it provides it very fucking easily. So just give it a give it a whirl if you need somebody to talk to. BetterHelp.com slash twisted. B e t t e r h e l p. Dot com it, slash it, twisted. It, it's hard to find a therapist, especially with 100%. COVID going on. They're all yeah. booked up. Everyone's got problems. So this is a very easy I think so. way to get in touch with someone. And that slash twisted thing is to get you 10% off your first month. So a little bit of a bump, too. But it's pretty affordable. It's pretty easy. So if you need somebody to talk to, if you have some stuff that you want to work out, there's no reason not to. Please do it, right, for us because we like having you on here every week. And for yourself, and go to betterhelp.com slash twisted. Get 10% off your first month. And get some help. I like the therapist being on the screen. I like them looking me in the eyes when I say my problems are because I'm attracted to my mom. 100%. 100%. I like wearing a loose tank top. Yeah. Every now and again, a tit falls out or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. We're back to the Lewis and Clark expedition. With thunder clappers in hand. With pills filled with mercury that's going to make you shit your pants okay. in hand. On May 14th, 1804, the 45 members of the Corps of Discovery... I like that name, as I opposed love to Louis, Lewis and Clark Expedition. Yep. The Corps of Discovery, they embarked from Camp Dubois, just outside of St. Louis, Missouri, to begin the westward journey up the Missouri River. Here's a quick creepy fact. William Clark, the part of you know Lewis and Clark, his fiance had said before they left in 1804 that she was going to wait for him, oh. that she was going to wait for him. It's not as – and she did get married when, when he got back. Yeah. They, she didn't know when he was coming back. Right. And she was going to wait for him. That's a big deal. That's, that's love. It's not as big of a deal. I think she was only 12 years old. It's fucking creepy. She didn't yeah. know when he <laughs> better. Yeah. He was 20 years older than her. So you can check the dates on that, but I think his fiance was 12 years Damn. old. Damn. I'll well, give you so, – Hang on. So he was going Go through – So she was 15 when he got back. That's, uh, yeah, that's so, almost – I think they got married when she was like 17. In Indiana, that's that's fine. 100%. Yep. That's cool, right? Yeah. Sp- around uh, wherever. <laughs> On August 20th, I'm going to give you a couple of highlights of their journey, right? It's a long journey. I'm just going to go through a couple of them. On August 20th, 1804, Sergeant Charles Floyd, you haven't heard his known, uh, his name before, he was the youngest man in the expedition. They took off on May 14th on August 20th. So he, May, June, July, and it's August. So four months into it, Sergeant Charles Floyd, the youngest man on the expedition, died of a ruptured appendix near modern-day Sioux City, Iowa. So they made it to Iowa before somebody died. This is a wild thing. Incredibly, Floyd is the only death to anybody in the expedition in the two plus years. That's wild. That's in, that. Forty five men come, forty five men leave, and forty four return. Bravo! I, yeah, I expect like half to die. I'd be like, oh, that's that's solid. I'd die. Yeah, I would be dead. There's there's. There's I mean, three of us in this room. Two of us would make it. They weren't distracted. There they was nothing unmarried. out there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I know they know how to like forage and find food, but there's just nothing out there. It's just them on their own. And one oh. person died. Plus, they wanted notoriety. Like, they wanted to be the, be able to come back and talk about it. I oh, have to yeah. imagine that had that held some weight in a bar. Breaking uh, news. Yes, yes. Breaking news. What? In May 2010, Antonio Banderas received an honorary doctorate from, doctorate from the University of Malaga, which I believe is in Spain. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Antonio Bandera is getting an honorary doctorate from the University of Malaga. Not only makes sense, it's fucking sexy. He's a yeah. sexy he didn't Spanish learn to speak doctor. English until his role in the Mambo, 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 Mambo Kings. Okay. He, that's two thousand. His role. That's two thousand ten. He got his doctorate, yeah. but in two thousand he received an honorary degree from Dickinson College. There it so is. that's true. Twisted history gives you the truth. We spit it at you. Um, In 2009, he had a benign tumor removed from his back. Did he? Yeah. Oh, what a scare. (laughs) Yeah. Right? So uh, we're four (laughs) months into it. We lose our first guy. That guy winds up being the only guy that we lose. Okay? That's August 20th, 1804. On November 11th, 1804, while constructing a fort in North Dakota, this is an important thing, they were among the hospitable Mondan and Hitatsa Indians, and they met this young broad named Sacagawea. She was 17 years old, and she was the pregnant wife of Toussaint Charbonneau, a French-Canadian trader hired by Lewis and Clark as a Hidatsa interpreter. So they didn't go after Sacagawea. They went after this guy, Toussaint Charbonneau. Toussaint off, uh, happened to have a 17-year-old knocked-up squaw. Yeah. <laughs> he did. Yeah. Like, that's it, what he had. Sacagawea was originally a Shoshone Indian who had been kidnapped by the Hidatsa at the age of 12 and then sold to this guy Charbonneau. 
<coughs> excuse me. Lewis and Clark hoped that she could help them communicate with any Shoshone they'd encounter on their journey. So they were like, we're taking her with us. Oh, we're taking yeah. this pregnant bitch with us because even though she's with the Hitatsu or whatever, we know we're going to have to deal with the Shoshone. So we want her to come with us. As a guide, as an interpreter, and as a forager, she proved to be an invaluable member of the expedition. So remember the fact that she was Shoshone, because that's the reason that she was taken yeah. along. So okay. Toussaint was just like, you know, this sounds great. I'd love to. A little dangerous. Yeah. So I'm going to send this 17-year-old pregnant girl. Who's pregnant with my kid. <laughs> with my kid, <laughs> yeah. February 11th, 1805. So we started off in May of 1804. On February 11th of 1805, uh, three months to the day after she joined the party, Sacagawea gave birth to a son, and she named him Jean Baptiste, and the explorers nicknamed him Pomp. These call him Pomp or Pompey. William Clark was very fond of this kid. Mm-hmm. I didn't write this down, but after everybody gets through it, I, you know he survives because I told you that. William Clark wound up uh, adopting Pompey after Sacagawea had passed away. He supported the kid and then wound up adopting him after Sacagawea. So William Clark uh, did that. Did he, yeah. did he adopt this kid with his 12-year-old bride? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pop was here, yeah, older than his wife. Yeah. On August 8th, 1805, the boys make it to the Shoshone people along the border of modern-day Montana and Idaho. And Lewis and Clark now believe the fate of the expedition hangs on finding the Shoshone and buying horses from them. It's the only way the Corps can hope to cross the, Mach- uh, the Rocky Mountains, the Mocky Mountains, before winter. So a lot of this was we take our canoes upstream or downstream. When we trek across land, we're dragging canoes. Mm-hmm. So they get to a point where they got to go through the Rocky Mountains. They need horses. They couldn't have had horses that survived with them si- since St. Louis. So when they get to like this Montana area that's ruled by the Shoshone Indians, they need to get horses from the Shoshone in order to make it over the Rocky Mountains, and that will then give them, boom, their I, last little leg down to uh, the Pacific Ocean. I believe they used keel boats for the first part of it. Keel boats, absolutely. A little bigger. 100%. So if they have to talk to Shoshones and haggle to get horses, who better to do it than with Sacagawea, mm-hmm. who's a full-blown Shoshone. So this is how it goes down. They go into the Shoshone camp. This is how I'm recreating. Yep, it's not yep. actually how it goes down. So they go into the Shoshone camp, and they bring Sacagawea, and they're like, all right, now don't fuck this up. We need horses. Do you know these people? She's like, I think I know these people. It's been a while. It's been five years since I've been kidnapped and all this stuff, but you know, I should know these people. I don't know what's been going on. I haven't been keeping in touch. There was no Facebook. Yeah. Right. So they go in there and they're like, don't fuck this up. Get us some horses. Sacagawea goes in. They say, uh, "Take." Uh, she says, take me to your leader, the Shoshone. So they say, okay. So they go. She meets the chief of the tribe. The chief of the tribe turns around and says, Sacagawea? And she says, Bob? It was her brother. So how fucked up is that? Yep. So now Sacagawea and her brother, boom, sells them the horses, no fucking problem. She's worth her weight in gold, this bitch. I love Sacagawea. And the guy's name wasn't Bob, obviously, but that's how it went down, basically. So now the guys have the horses, and they can make it over the Rocky Mountains. Still a pain in the balls. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're they so have, glad they called Sacagawea. 100%. Imagine Toussaint trying to, to get that. Yeah. Oh, so, hey, I God. knocked up your sister. Can we get some horses? Yeah, that was August 8th. By November 24th, they finally reached the Pacific coast, just in time to hunker down in winter quarters before turning around and heading home, which I mentioned before. All right, we're at the Pacific. Oh, awesome. What are we going to do? Get some sleep. We got to go home. It's kind of like uh, the Free Solo or the Alpinist documentary. 100%. Like they climb the mountain. Then they have to go back they down. Go back they, down don't, they don't show that it part. sucks. Yeah. yeah. The only thing is is that they made uh, relationships along the way. So even through like the leanest parts of their voyage or their expedition, they knew that there were friendly Indian tribes. Like there was one Indian tribe that fed them so much, they all got sick just because they were, they were just gobbling down food like fucking was this, turkeys. Was this uh, the salmon when they, they ate no, salmon? No, 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 not the Are salmon because it had sand in it. That's why they went to the dogs. I'm going to close on that. Okay, all right. Because yeah, yeah. I... Go ahead. All right. No. Oh, we'll talk about it then. On, on lowering the bar, we tried horse meat chips. Yes. And they were lovely. I brought this up on the episode. Lewis and Clark ate their horses and their dogs. Mm-hmm. That was what we talked about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because they liked the red meat more than the salmon. Like the salmon was just kind of eh. Well, no, because fresh the salmon. salmon wasn't fresh. Oh. What they did was is that they were given dried salmon. It's essentially 
so, jerky? Yeah, it was essentially jerky. Uh-huh. And a lot of this jerky was preserved in sand. So it, was, it had like a gritty type thing to it, too, that didn't agree with them either. Right. So there was more thing like, oh, what a bunch of uh, prissy guys that they weren't enjoying fresh salmon steak. Like, I could take a salmon steak and a stick. Mm-hmm. All I need is a little bit of lemon. I can make someone knock your fucking eye out. Right. But, you know, if it's like dirty salmon jerky, I might eat a dog, too. We'll get to it. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to it. So on July 25th, 1806, so on the way home, they mm-hmm. turned around in November. On July 25th, 1806, Clark etches his name and the date into a sandstone outcropping near modern-day Billings, Montana. And he names that outcropping Poppy's Tower after Sacagawea's son. It remains the only physical, other than their toxic shit, it <laughs> remains the only physical evidence of Lewis and Clark's expedition that survives today. So we have, you know, we don't have any pictures. We have journals. Mm-hmm. We have journals. We have toxic shit. But as far as anything that they left their mark on the land, the only thing that's left today, over 200 years later, is when Clark decided just to take time to etch his name into what he wound up calling Pompey's Tower somewhere in Billings, Montana. That's pretty cool. Shows you the quality of person, right? Yeah. Because they could have done it everywhere they went. They could have left their mark and left a trail and scratched into rocks, but they didn't deface anything except... They, they made their one mark. 100%. He probably all, thought about it the whole trip, where he was going to do yeah. it, too. Yeah, and all of the forts that they built along the way were torn down and re-fortified. So it's not like there's an original you know hut made from them. So it's right. kind of cool that the only thing is is an etching. So that next day, so that was Clark that did that little etching. That next day, Lewis catches a small group of Blackfeet Indians trying to steal their guns and horses, and he kills one of them. Mm-hmm. Lewis kills a young brave. That was the only native death on the whole expedition. Somebody said that there's another incident where another native had died. So there's so this there's either one or two Indians. I'm going to go with this story that only one died in that incident. So we're going to talk about the fact that these guys were gone for nearly three years, what they'd gone through. They only lost one member of the expedition party, and they only killed one Indian along the way. Was this because his dog was stolen? No, you know, so the dog, There's and I'm going to get about to that. Yeah, yeah, so the dog was stolen. He sent like a four man team to go get him. Mm-hmm. Sent it, yeah, so it was big time. John, sub- John Wick before John Wick. I was going to say that. Yeah, Look what yeah. John Wick did. And you yeah. can imagine what this guy did. On September 23rd, 1806, the Corps of Discovery arrived back in St. Louis, and they were exhausted explorers and greeted as heroes. So they started in Missouri, they entered Kansas. They headed due north along the eastern border of Nebraska, then directly through the heart of South Dakota and North Dakota before hanging a hard left and cutting across Montana. They went through the northern tip of Iowa, excuse me, Idaho, and then straddled the Washington Oregon border until they hit the Pacific. And they did it in two and a half years. And they did it in the early 1800s. And they did it with only losing one man to a burst appendix and killing only one Native American. That's extraordinary. That's that's extraordinary history. And that's the reason why we're talking about it today. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think that that's extraordinary history. And the Native American people weren't all unfriendly. I don't mean to say that every time they went in there, it was like a last of the Mohicans type thing. Some of them were quite... <laughs> were quite the opposite. Yeah. Some of them offered up their wives as sexual tributes, a thing that I would never do. The tribes of the High Plains believed that spiritual power passed between people during the act of banging. So by sharing their wives, they could appropriate the power of the person being banged. And nobody seems to have more power than a white man back then with his guns, his ability to work metal, his technological prowess. One member of the Corps of Discovery was offered four Mandan women in a single night. They just want your power, Phipps. They just want your power. I could That's a, women weaken the legs. Yeah, I don't want them sucking my soul out. <laughs> Clark's black slave, York. Imagine that. This big black guy was even more magical. They never saw a black guy in their lives. So this guy was they fucking magical. The women were like, I so, want his power. <laughs> yeah. So York was swimming seeing his wand. in indigenous <laughs> Pussy. Yeah. He was killing it, That's absolutely killing it. Oh, well, it's Tomahawk. For York. Yeah, I York. Just, look, look, look. By the way, at one point, I'm going to mention this too. They came to a fork in the road, and this was like an official government expedition. They came to a fork in the road, and they were deciding which way to go, 
and they like had it. They took a vote between everybody. Right. And York and Sacagawea were both given a vote. It was like the first time an indigenous person and a black man was given the right to vote in anything that had anything to do with the government uh, thing. Like that's kind of cool too. York was killing it with Indian women. Yeah. I mean, slaying it two at a yeah, time. Yeah. Like, just imagine it. You know what I'm saying? And then Sacagawea was uh, was Sacagawea, right? So we mm-hmm. made a bunch of fucking statues about it. Um, I said there were 45 members of the expedition, but there was actually one more, and his name was Seaman, which is why I mentioned they never ate Seaman. Seaman was a Newfoundland. They're big. Newfies are big. Huge. Big dogs. They're considered one of the most... Tra- and Seaman himself is considered one of the most traveled dogs in human history. Seaman was purchased in 1803 specifically for the expedition by Captain Lewis while he was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He chose a Newfoundland whose estimated weight is 150 pounds because they do well on boats, they're good swimmers, and they can assist in water rescues. Ergo the name Seaman, mm-hmm. right? He was, he was a water dog. So a modern commenter on the expedition remarked that Lewis seems to have been happiness, happiest excuse me, when he was alone on shore with his gun, with his notebook, and with his dog. Hell yeah, brother. Right? That's, a, yeah. that's a man's Ice cold beer, man. my dog, and my dark gun. Do I have my dark gun on me? Oh, no, I left it on my desk. That's like you and your tweets, Vibs. Yeah, you and you your tweets. You dogs. Yeah. You yeah. Know, you know, your I laptop just, is your... Yeah, that's all I want to do is just, is just sit, off with, to the side. sit with my sit with my dogs yeah. and just but drink, Siemens, drink a coffee. Siemens, the reason I brought this whole fucking thing up, the reason that they survived was because they ate over two hundred dogs. The Indians, our boys, encountered along the way eight dogs, and so did members of the expedition when nothing else was available, particularly particularly in the dry areas of what is now Eastern Washington, where there was little, if any, game, and the only other choice was dried salmon, gotcha. dried and preserved salmon. And the men came to prefer dog instead. And I don't mean to make too much of it because their favorite food would have been elk. They ate a lot of beaver tail, which I like saying out loud. They ate a lot of buffalo. <laughs> but dogs would do if dogs were all they could get. Only Clark, only William Clark was the only guy to abstain. He was the guy who never, he couldn't bring himself to eat dog meat. But as I mentioned before, he had no problems Marrying a 15-year-old girl, right? Everyone's so, got weird morals. You know yeah, what I mean? It's, yeah, it's I won't different. eat dog, but yeah. I have a 12-year-old fiancé. Yeah. I, I don't know. So my point is, and this is how I'm going to end this podcast right now. My point is, is that in, during a trip over hostile and uncharted land, the members of Lewis and Clark Expedition had to do many things to stay alive. Sometimes they had to have sex with multiple indigenous women in one night. Takes your legs from it. Sometimes they had to eat dog. Sometimes they had to eat horse. But there's one thing you could say for sure is that they never eat semen. Right? And that's pretty commendable. Unless, of course, that's what you like to do. That's it for the Twisted History of Lewis and Clark. Thank you, Vibs, as always. Thank you, Annie, for everything that you do. John, uh, big thank you, the voice of God. And we'll see you guys uh, next week. One final addendum before we go. I know I've mentioned it a couple of times. We're still trying to do this two cents thing. So mm. Two Cents is a different uh, platform where you can listen to a uh, podcast. I don't have any skin in the game with Two Cents. I don't. It's not anything that Barstool owns or anything like that. It's just something where we can actually hear people's ideas of what they think about the podcast and what they want to hear. Like I just did this whole podcast on when a guy sent me an email saying that they ate 200 dogs. Right. It, That's how it happened. Feedback is huge. It's yeah. essential. So uh, www.the2cents.audio slash twisted. audio slash twisted. And it's one of these things that's in beta. We're just kind of fucking around with it. Yeah. So the more we use it, the better it'll get. And it'll be a good way for us to get feedback. That's all we want. We want feedback. I think this should be more of an interact. I think sometimes the comment sections are better than the blogs on Barstool Sports, right? Like yeah. Yeah, sometimes are. And so that's what this is essentially trying to become. So again, uh, www.twocents.audio slash twisted. All right, so that's it. That's the twisted history of Lewis and Clark. Thank you so much, Annie. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much, Vibsy. And we'll see you guys all next week on Twisted History. 